Welcome to Mechanicsburg Mystery Presents, A Conversation with Laurie R. King. If anyone has earned the praise, a person who needs no introduction, it would be her. Over a 30-year-plus career, she has won all the awards in the mystery field, starting with an Edgar Award for Best First Novel, followed by the Agatha, Nero, McCavity Awards, and rounded out by being named an Edgar Grandmaster two years ago. She has written five novels and a novella in her Kate Martinelli series, and she has also written several non-series non books, but she's best known for her 18 books featuring Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes, the latest of which, The Landerns Dance, we will discuss today. Now, if I had an audience, I would say, please give a warm welcome <laughs> from Mechanicsburg Mystery to Laurie R. King. Thank you, Laurie. I, I hear the applause, Bill, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll add that in post. But yes. <laughs> thank you so much. This is a real thrill to be able to talk to you today as well. Uh, but I wanted to start first with um, your non-series, possible series book, Back to the Garden. It's uh, a new series. It is a series. Yep. Uh, yep. Good. I'll have to correct the, the Wikipedia page for that. Uh, it is featuring a San Francisco police investigator, Rachel Lang. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Raquel. Raquel Lang. Yep. Ra Raquel, thank you for correcting me. By the way, I forgot to mention, always jump in and correct me when I get something wrong. I have no problems at all. Mistakes are a part of my life. <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, I, can you start off by uh, uh, giving a brief description for our audience? Yes. Um, I, as you know, uh, the first book that I published was, it wasn't the first I wrote, but the first I published was about a San Francisco homicide inspector named Kate Martinelli. And as you say, there's five of those books and a novella. <clears throat> but when I thought about writing a new one in that series, I had some problems, um, partly because, you know, it had been, well, since the novella was done, it was, a, six years or so and since the last novel came out it was closer to 20 so um I thought instead of writing a character that has just sort of disappeared for years and would at any rate in the timeline of the of the series would be pretty much on the edge of retirement I thought I might experiment with writing a sort of related series but um but but its own thing <clears throat> so raquel lang is also a, an inspector when you first meet her she is <clears throat> an inspector with the san francisco police department uh working homicide um but she has had some problems, partly medical and partly there's something in the background that you it takes a while to figure out, that has moved her sideways into cold case, which is fairly common for detectives in a large department um, who are quite capable, but have some reason why they can't be working in the field. Um, either because they've been injured or because in a lot of cases they're retired. So when she gets to cold case, she meets a man that people who know the Martinelli books will find familiar, Al Hawken. <clears throat> he is a long retired um, detective, but he is too, is too skilled to just let him go. And so he works part-time in the cold case department. And one of those cases that he introduces her too, is uh, is related to a case that pops up when um, when the book begins. Okay, and I understand uh, there's really a lot to talk about here because she is, in a way, you see similarities between her and Holmes in that she's a very sensitive and brilliant investigator. She relies a lot on micro clues and micro expressions. And yet, because she's in the police department, she has trouble working with other people. I think probably like if Holmes was a part of Scotland Yard, he would have been bounced because he would have just upset them too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, there's certain certain people that don't, don't work well in a in an organization like that. 
Yeah, um, she is what you might call neurodivergent. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of convenient categories that you can use for people who, um, you know, who look at the world in in interesting ways, and. I don't think she receives any particular diagnosis in this book. Um, you just know that she is, she has a different way of doing things. And partly that was deliberate because I, as I wrote her, I realized how very, very similar she was to this character, Sherlock Holmes. Um, and so instead of, um, pulling her back and making her more of a of a community cop i decided to to you know to really go for it and make her very very holmesian so yes so she is and the, the two the two of them have a lot of similarities in how they handle things and how they don't handle things so that's true because uh, she doesn't have Holmes's wide ranging knowledge. She doesn't do the researches. She is just very clever, at least so far as we've seen to in this book as well, because she gets involved in investigating a serial killer known as the Highwayman through Al Hawken, who actually kind of mentors her yeah. as far as um, you know, being able to relate to other people. And she uses her skills in trying to ferret out information from him. Uh, this is only one aspect of this of the book because it also takes place at um, a mansion, uh, much like I think of as the Biltmore Mansion in North Carolina, in which it's not no longer a family mansion, although it's still owned. Uh, you no, know, it's owned by a trust. Is was uh, that particular mansion? Was that based on anything out in, in California or on yeah. the peninsula? Yeah, there is um, there is a place that is similar in certain ways i didn't want to make it that place um to to sort of take a take an existing place and work all of its details into the story i i thought about it but um part, partly i wrote it during lockdown and so um, actual in person research was a little tricky but also not putting something's proper name on it allows you to be more flexible in how the layout of the ground is and its history and that sort of thing. But yeah, it is based on a, an estate called Filoli, F-I-L-O-L-I, -L -L um, which is about, I don't know, 20 miles south of San Francisco um, and has a similar kind of history to the Gardner estate in this book up until the 1970s um, when uh, one of the family comes home from Vietnam and um, and then ends up taking over the estate and making it a commune. That is the Gardner estate, not Filoli. Filoli yeah. was never was never one of the. There are there are some houses in California that were taken over and made um, hip, hippie communes, um, but this is not Filoli was not one of them. But. Uh, it enabled me to do some fun things with the timelines so that there's two timelines that run through this and they're connected by the estate and by events on the estate. So one of them is um, the 1970s. And I, I had I had originally thought I might do it in the 60s because I mean, the 60s, what's not to love about doing a book set in the 60s, right? Until I realized that if people had been adults in the 60s, they'd, they'd be beyond gray haired and getting, <laughs> getting into old when it comes to the current time. And I thought I really wanted to have characters who were still lively enough to be considered uh, worthy of um, prosecution should they be thought guilty of something i mean if someone's in their late 90s you're probably not a very urgent um legal legal case against them but someone in their 80s is still active enough i mean i yeah yeah hi and... um so so there's these these two timelines one of them is now and one of them is the 1970s um that and it turned out to be a really interesting time to write about because it was not the 60s, this optimistic, you know, we're going to change the world kind of time. 
And it wasn't the 80s where, you know, the, the true goal of women was to have an office job that you could wear large shoulder pads in. I mean, that's it, kind of a big, a big jump between the 60s and the AIDS and crack cocaine epidemic 80s. And so the seventies fit in right quite nicely with what I what I needed them to do. Yeah, this would be the late seventies because the commune lasted about four years from something like seventy five to seventy nine. That's that that era, and I was kind of thinking about that because I was a teenager then, and of course that was Jimmy Carter and disco. But at the same time, because I was young enough to remember Woodstock, but not to go there, I had thorough grounding through Mad Magazine of what the 60s was like. So it 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 kind of works because you still have it's like a gong being strung struck. The ver reverberations still proceed down because at that time that your that your story takes place when the commune was being settled at the Gardner estate, you know, I'm reading Mad Magazine and listening to punk rock and there was Z underground zines being passed around and R Crumb was still drawing. So it kind of works. It works well. So and it's uh, also a time when my local area in the Northern California did indeed have serial killers working the area. I mean, my little, you know, tourist community um still very left-wing santa cruz had no fewer than three serial killers working the area in the early 70s a, a time when i was regularly hitchhiking yeah i didn't know that i was familiar with ted bundy up in seattle but i didn't realize you had uh well of course when you have a lot of young people running around with not much sense of safety around them yeah. un unfortunately you get uh predators um, and this is where what this book is about is it's two stories because it's the story of the Gardner estate and Rob Gardner, who was the heir and the commune that he settled. And at the same time, there's Raquel investigating the highwayman serial killer who is now hospitalized and dying, but she's questioning him to try to find out who he actually murdered. And then there's a body found on the estate, or at least the bones found on the estate, uh, underneath a large statue. And again, there's so much to talk about here because you have this artist named Gatto who does these big sculptures. Obviously, I don't know, inspired, it was inspired by anybody like the Watts Tower and Henry Moore. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of artists that did that do that kind of, uh, that kind of monumental and very wild art, but yes, they yeah so they moved the, the the trust that is now this this um this estate is no longer a commune and it's now being preserved and they put on programs and it's like font hill castle in pennsylvania and winter thur and all these dupont estates here they now have programs and gardens and they have to attract tourists they move the statue and they find the bones of a person underneath yeah clearly was poured because they know when the statue was poured after a concert was held there back in 76 or 77, I forget the year. So Raquel is kind of torn between investigating the serial killing case and investigating the Gardner estate as well, isn't she? I think near the yeah. end, she actually was, you know, concerned about it. And and then of course, um, be, <laughs> being being mystery readers, um, we, we know that, the, these cases are not going to ultimately go, you know, diverge in opposite directions. We know that they're going to come together in some way. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's the only question is how, and I can obviously no spoilers here for this kind of podcast, mm. especially when we get to the lanterns dance, boy, I can't, there are going to be things <laughs> I, got, I may, have yeah. to, may have to edit portions <laughs> of this out, but um <laughs> It, it may not happen the way you think it will. I'll just leave it at that. Don't assume what you can, what you're going to see, because it's, it's fascinating along the way, because um, part of what makes Raquel Lang interesting is the moral quandary she finds herself in as far as how far to pursue the serial killer case. And there's actually some, I wouldn't want to say a moral lesson, but there's kind of an interesting moral teaching about kind of listening to your body. Is that from any kind of, um, I don't know, any kind of religious tradition or moral tradition? 
she's t- there she's trying to figure out what to do and it's almost like what do you do if you go so far how do you how does your body react your body teaches you what you should do yeah i i think that that's <laughs> In this, in these days of very complicated social media, um, it's it's difficult to be that simple. But I think that ultimately, um, people who are not of a sociopathic tendency know when something is right and wrong. Um, we may not choose to do it. We may decide that there is a greater good and a lesser good. But I think even, you know, what what's the what's the ethics that all small children focus in on very early is, is it fair? You know, I mean, this is something that that small kids, all small kids complain that it's not fair. And I think that indicates to me that this the 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 moral sense is is something that we grow very early. And as I said, some of us don't grow it because of various um social and or neurological problems. Um, some of us manage to ignore it because it's inconvenient, but it's there. And I think someone like Raquel Lang, whose entire universe is internal, um, looks at herself for, for guidance of, you know, what, if I did this, what would it leave me feeling? And if I did that, how would I feel then? And that's how she chooses. Yeah, because it's very easy to think I shouldn't do this because it affects my job. It affects my income. It affects something as opposed to doing the right thing anyway and maybe accepting the consequences. Yeah, and I think, again, that's very, very Sherlockian Mm -hmm. because Holmes, um, time and again, puts himself and his friends into danger because he has to do it the way that he sees necessary. Um, he offends people because he has to do it a certain way. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, that, that, as I said, Raquel Lang is very like that. Mm -hmm. I found it very interesting in the book about the commune itself, because you go into detail about the running of the commune, the events that take place there, the, the, the discussions that go on as they're all trying to figure out the right way to do something. And Rob um, Rob Gardner is a very interesting character in that context because the way you depict him, he is wanting to follow the spirit of the commune, but at the same time, this is his family home. And that leads to some interesting questions, I think. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you do if you are a communist and believe in when you have a community of people, they all have an equal voice. But nonetheless, um, you have strong feelings about this place that the rest of them don't. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even if it's something like that, that giant wisteria there really could be better growing something that we could eat like grapevines. But he loves the wisteria. And so what is, you know, as the, as the nominal owner of this property, what do I have the right to to di- to do and to say? So yeah, when do you dictate? And if, as you point out, some people are more equal than others. Particularly his, I don't know, girlfriend, partner, Meadow, and she is a fascinating character because she is a very strong woman who comes in and does what she does. And when she is done, she is a very determined woman in whatever thing she's had multiple careers lawyer um a roadie you had her uh, she was a band manager as well and now she's kind of running this commune and you could see the other again i love the way you wrote all this that's what i'm trying to get across to the readers is that you have these discussions that are fraught with peril because 
if handled wrong, it will blow up the commune. You know, people will just get pissed and the emotions will fly. And they look to her for guidance. You know, she has a vote, but she has a big vote is kind of like the way to put it. Is she based on people that you knew? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> Yourself? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, um, I think that, you know, competent women um, are found in all the corners of life. And if someone like that had chosen to go into politics, she, you know, she would be Hillary Clinton or, you know. Margaret anyway. Thatcher. <laughs> Oh, maybe not that. <laughs> I'm talking not political, but determination. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, polit- I mean, somebody who has yeah. enormous skills and the and the strength of will to push them, push them forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean that you know that you need to to do that job in an outside world. You can do that job in a very enclosed world, such as a as a community. Yeah. Now, what also I appreciated is the little things that you put in here, these little moments. And there's one in particular that made me laugh because uh, some of this book is told through the eyes of Jerry, who is the, the family lawyer. He's the younger lawyer, so he's of their age. And of course, he's walking in. He walked into the commune when it was in Oregon in this suit, and he's driving down this muddy road. And he sees this poor Jerry. You you gotta feel for him, poor Jerry. <laughs> oh, he he finds his way through. But there's a little moment, and again, it has nothing to do with the main story. But he's explaining to this couple, members of the commune who just had their child but they didn't want to file a birth certificate with the state because the state is the man and by God, you don't want to do this. And he, they're fine with all the restrictions that would be placed on them, except that without a birth certificate, the father would have no rights. And if something happened to the mother, the child would be adopted by her parents. And did you really want that? And they signed. And again, you put all these little moments in here. Is it just something that is, like you just come across an inspiration that says, I got, I heard this story. I got to put this in. Is it from there or just? Well, yeah. I mean, when you're putting together a story like this, um, what you, what you're trying to find are bits and pieces that do dual duty. I mean, that you can have a scene like that, that provides a bit of amusement that provides a background that shows how Jerry is becoming a part of this community but that also gives you the larger picture. So that um, one of the things about the 70s and the commune movement was that it was when the people who put together organic farms and um, an equal say communities in the 60s we're coming up against the reality of taxes and um, children. I mean, if you have kids, don't you want them to go to a dentist? If you have kids and you have a small commune, who's going to teach them other than just the people who are right there and, uh, you know, that, that are underfoot? So an awful lot of the commune movement in the 70s um, disintegrated because people have kids. And when you have kids, your life steps sideways. Mm -hmm. So that's partly what's going on in the Gardner community during this time is that, um, you know, everyone who has kids is, is looking at something from a slightly different point of view from those who don't. And sometimes a community can come together and incorporate both. And other times, quite often in the 70s, it it just didn't. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I liked about the book, especially. I mean, there's a lot to like about the book. There's, you know, um, i make sure I get her name right. Raquel's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Raquel's investigation, her... Uh, interactions with Al, with uh, D, her sister, I believe, who's a, a recluse and a 
uh, online, I wouldn't say hacker is not the right word for it, but maybe she is a hacker, I guess. Activist. Activist, yes. A hacker, or what do they call activist. them? They, they sometimes call them activist, yes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to seeing more, since you're doing a series, I'm looking forward to seeing more of their their interactions yeah. and what she does. Um, so, like I said, I highly recommend the book. Uh, it's I mean, if you're interested in 70s, in communes, and of course in uh, Raquel Lane as well. Now let's go ahead and move on to the Lantern's Dance, which is your 18th uh, Mary Russell Sherlock Holmes book. Um, and it is a, um, again, there's all these pieces that you put together that is just individually interesting because I, I wrote things down like the Zotrope, uh, the Vernet family of painters that you go into because, of course, Sherlock is related to them. Uh, the, it, for those who don't know, uh, his grandmother was a sister of Vernet, the French artist. And there's a famous phrase about art in the blood takes the most peculiar terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also you have France and India. You have scenes that take place there. Where did all this come from as far <laughs> as like the descriptions <laughs> you have? so okay. much that you're you're i guess there's just seems like so much experience in life poured into this book where did it come from well i think you know i i am not somebody who um who outlines books so i i rarely know where a book is going until i start getting into it and that means that sometimes i end up um exploring different paths that i it took it would take me a while to see how they're related so one of the things in the background of this book is that um i wanted to look at holmes's past because we looked somewhat at russell's past in a book set in san francisco called locked rooms that was several several books ago but um there's uh, Arthur Conan Doyle tells us almost nothing about Sherlock Holmes. I mean, we know who he is when he's in a room with with Dr. Watson and we know how his brain works and, and so on. But his background is almost non-existent. He has a brother who's seven years older, who is something big in the government. He is uh, his grandmother, as you say, was a, a sister of the artist Frenet without saying which for nay, although he means Horace, um, that he went to university, but it never says which one or whether he actually graduated uh, or even what he was studying there. And, um, and, and I mean, that's, that's kind of all you find out about him that, and he, the Holmes family were um, country squires so that, at some point, somebody married into this family of country squires, which it's not much there for someone like me to work with, um, which is great because I can do stuff and people can't point to it and say, well, that's not right. But on the other hand, I my whole series is set on working with the character as he is in 1915 when my other character meets him. So I take what Conan Doyle has given me at the beginning of the Great War and build a character off of that. Um, <clears throat> and it was time to see where he came from, um, particularly because they are um, <clears throat> working their way across Europe and, and meeting up with uh, the sun that, again, this is not something that Conan Doyle um, uh, honored him with. Um, this is something in the in the Laurie King canon <laughs> is that it he had it is. with it is. with Irene Adler in uh, 1894. And um, and, um, you know, so here he has this future of the son and the grandchild. And this blank past that I wanted to fill in. So that's where that's where it started from. Um, to look at where, you know, where he came from. Now, right. there's a world of Sherlockian studies that picks on teeny, teeny hints in the stories. 
and um and and builds an entire academic theory around this particular little tiny hint one of those says that he had that holmes had some background in india for various reasons ranging from the persian slipper to his mentioning that he liked curry to uh, the fact that he did not mention india when he met, when he says that he went from um from mecca to um tibet to lasha to, to the hip foothills of tibet and you can't i mean you can't get there without i mean you can but this mostly you go through india so why why didn't he mention india oh and the sitting the sitting in meditation on cushions mm -hmm. that's clearly he was versed in meditation so, so i thought india works for me um my husband was born and raised in india he was a, an anglo indian but um but the rene family obviously were um were french and so i wanted to have the overlap in france rather than than england so i started looking at the french colonies there were five french colonies um this would have been during the time of um of the um british east india company before the raj came in and set things all right so but uh, so I had that's where that's where it all started. This business of having this young woman who is taken from her mother and ends up in India, who somehow or other um, overlaps back again with the Vernays at some point. But we don't really know how until spoilers. Yeah, so. absolutely. And it's built the story itself is built where Holmes and Russell are separated because Russell has injured her leg and again you have a heroine who is walking with a cane um but she's staying behind they uh they go to the Adler's house in in France as outside of Paris as I understand yeah. Yeah. and find them missing because they've been menaced by some men poss including one who broke into the house possibly India and again you yes. know they're they're trying to figure this out from from witnesses reconstructions but the point though is that she's left behind with cases of paintings that were sent from the um uh it's the French academy there's I have the name here, but I've now lost in my notes, but it is an actual academy. Academy, Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it, it contains Vernet paintings and a zoetrope and a book with some writing in it, which she has to decode. So we're getting both this story of, and it's very artistically told. I, I, again, you, I love the way, instead of it not just being a diary, but it's, images it's presented as a series of images so again yeah. you have that recurring theme of art only it's verbal art and not yeah. visual art yeah yeah because i mean a journal like this um that she finds and she has to decipher is is composed of i think there's 13 um chapters each of which captures a period of the journalist's life and each one is built on an image that she has of her mother framed in the window of a carriage as the carriage is pulling away and the mother is standing there weeping. Um, you know, each one has a sort of frame around it. And I thought that's very like a zoetrope that you have a strip of paper with images that each one slightly changes and, and then goes, they, they, you know, go back and meet. Um, that together animate in the, the early animation of of that because you spin the thing around there's little holes in the side of the thing and the eyes link all those still images together to make a moving image and so that's what the 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 lantern that she finds the image lantern that um that russell finds in this box um is something that belonged to this young girl lakshmi and um, and somehow or other is linked to the the box of paintings that is sent to Damien from the academy. Yes, and there's that all is. kinds of clues in there, including yeah. in the paintings and the derogatypes as well. So it yeah. all kind of again, no spoilers, but it all will make sense in the end. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> it does to me anyway. 
<laughs> well, and according to the reviews I've read as well, yes, it all it does all make sense. And I say that too. I shouldn't shouldn't exclude myself. <laughs> I'm just a reader. I'm not a reviewer. I've, I gave that up a long time ago. Um, so how much research did you have to do as far as all these areas of interest, French paintings, French country life in the 20s, uh, India as well? You have lots of scenes that take place everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, India, I've, I've been to India a couple of times, spent some time there. Um, and although I was mostly on the other side of the country, it's amazing how little India has changed since, you know, before the days of electricity. Um, I obviously you have to do your research and things like uh, when I first wrote, there's a scene with a lantern in it, uh, a lamp. And I first wrote it and they had, it was a kerosene or paraffin. And I thought, when did, <laughs> when did paraffin come in? And I had to look it up and sure enough, it would, wouldn't have been paraffin. It would have been whale oil. So, <laughs> so you, you gotta, you gotta double check yourself because there's things that you think, you know, and you don't. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, um, a lot of research, um, you end up doing, you know, a couple of times I've bought collections of postcards that are printed. I mean, not so much for the 1840s, but for certainly the 1920s are a great source of, because everybody sent postcards home and they see so that you have these great images of things um, from the 20s. And, um, and of course, a lot of stuff written th during the time, um, mostly mostly the English writing it, but some French, so. Yeah. yeah, but it seems like also the focus of the book is also the relationship between Damien and Sherlock, because it's at this point in their lives fraught with peril, since uh, Sherlock obviously didn't know of Damien's existence until something like six years before. And he, of course, never knew, or I cannot remember if he knew or not, of who his father really was, but there's natural resentments going on there that have just built up and they have to, again, sort of like uh, Raquel has, Sherlock has to figure out the right approach. And this kind of reflective Sherlock is very interesting and very different from the early Sherlock's who just kind of was all mind and no emotion. And now he's having to kind of work it out. All this untidy emotion is just, yes, very difficult for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, one of the things that I, this is 30 years, this, this has been 30 years that I've been writing these characters, yeah. that, but published 30 years ago. And one of the things that has come to interest me, at first, Holmes was a supporting actor. He was background character he was there to lend a hand he was there to do his own investigation then he'd come back and and share the information with russell who because they're first person books from russell's point of view so therefore you know he was always at a remove starting in the late 90s um I started uh, I wrote a book that the one that I mentioned set in San Francisco where because it deals with things in Russell's past that she misremembers and she has suddenly become an unreliable narrator, you really need to see things from Holmes's point of view. So he gets chapters where they're not first person, they're third person. But um, he, he gives, he sees things in a different way from Russell. And the reader gradually comes to realize that he's seeing them in as fact as the way things actually were. And she has been traumatized by her childhood into misremembering things. So starting with that book, I've incorporated his point of view in, in most of them from, you know, some chapters would be, you follow him going off and doing things and then they come back and it's from her point of view. But as I as I worked with Holmes and became more internal with him, I began to think about how, I mean, he has a huge effect on Mary Russell, obviously. He, you know, comes into her life when she's 15 and he 
basically changes her life. But what would that situation have done to him as a person? I mean, he's, here's this Victorian middle-aged male who has never been very good with people, who suddenly has an apprentice whose mind works just like his. And begin, he begins to, to suspect that his way of doing things, that is, I'm right on anything, may not be the ideal approach to certain things. So in the last book, um, it had a lot to do with <clears throat> young women in, uh, in Transylvania. And there's a couple sections in there where you see Holmes reflecting that he may not be quite as good on getting into the minds of women as he, he might want to be. Um, and so that's kind of where he's coming from, from this in the series. And so when he gets to France, he then is questioning his relationship as a father, as a grandfather. Who am I? What is this? What are my responsibilities? How much do I need to give way to other people's needs? <laughs> you know, why, yep. why don't you just do it the way I say it and get on with it? That um, happens a couple of times in there where he wants Damien to do something and darn it, he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to to learn to to step back and allow other people to say in things, it doesn't come easy to a person like that. I mean, it, it wouldn't, and it doesn't fictionally either. So, so that's, I mean, it's this interesting transition point in the life of this. I mean, he's now in his 60s. So if you don't grow up then, I don't know when you will. Well, I think, I think only speaking personally, there's, there's a lot of things that became a lot clearer in the last 10 years for me as far as my past and of course i've been married for um was it really 30 years you say th you've been writing for 30 years you've been writing as long as i've been married to to Teresa, and we have changed over the years it's hard it's i wouldn't say it's impossible not knowing any other long marriages but we have we have grown closer together and we've had to consider each other as we have to be aware of each other and we have to work our way around whatever kind of difficulties we have had. And some of it, as far as a man, is just being able to express myself, to express myself emotionally, to say why I'm feeling a certain way when we're talking about plans. It was very difficult to just say, I don't really want to do this. But it, over time, that eased, eased up. And I could see the same thing happening with Sherlock and uh, Mary Russell as well. I mean, it just in a good marriage. And this is something that's rarely seen, I think, even in mysteries is a married couple, isn't there? A married couple that's happily married, essentially working in harness. Yeah. Yeah. You you tend to have a lot of unconnected private investigators, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Someone with serial girlfriends or, you know, the, the, the spouse who dies so you can launch the revenge plot to investigate and find them. And, you know, it's actually rather refreshing now to see something, you know, a family, a couple that works. <laughs> well, they're definitely a partnership. Yeah. And that's what it is. Yes, it is a partnership. Now, I understand. Is there uh, activities, since this is the 30th anniversary of, of The Beekeeper's Apprentice, is there, are there activities to celebrate this? Oh, yes, yes. We're having a lot of fun with The Beekeeper. Yeah, we, we kind of, we started in January. Um, I think Beekeeper's Apprentice was probably published in February of 1994. Um, but so we started in January, but of course, with a new book out, you tend not to focus too much on a 30 year old book. So we sort of slowed it down a little bit. But, um, but I, I think things are picking up again. Now I, I have four in person um, day long celebrations, sort of a mini con <laughs> mm -hmm. about um, beekeeper and they're, they're going to I, we had one and it was absolutely a blast and we we're looking forward to three more. Each one of them is the day before a conference. So people who are coming in for left coast crime for malice domestic and for voucher con, um, if they come in a day early, they can, they can play Russell and Holmes and each one of the events is different, but we have um, 
three of them, I think we have beekeepers coming to talk about bees, to actually show bees. They have demonstration hives and you can see the queen and pick her out and, you know, I mean, and, and to talk about, you know, what is it about bees and Sherlock Holmes? Why did Conan Doyle make him a beekeeper? Um, what, what is it that fascinates him about, about bees? Um, we're also doing um, that we have at one of the events in Mal at Malice Domestic, we have a woman who's a martial artist who's coming to um, demonstrate knife throwing because Mary Russell carries a knife in her boot. And so she's, <laughs> she's going to demonstrate how to throw an eye. Um, and, you know, another woman is coming to talk about 20s clothing. And we have a couple of the events had a lock picker because, you know, when you're reading a book, you always have this. This kind of vague description of somebody bending down and, you know, then eventually there's a click and the door opens and you think, how do they do that? Well, I'm the writer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they know they're supposed to know I, they want to get into I, that room. <laughs> I let my characters do it. But um, but we had a, you know, a guy who does there's a sport called lock picking sport. I mean, it's called lock sport. And and so he's a he is a security expert, but he. He 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 plays at lock picking and teaches. So, so you know, it's a way of building community because I find that when you have, I mean, anyone who has a long lived series such as this, eighteen books plus a short story collection, um, there's a community of readers who come together, and the you know we have a Facebook group page, and we get together at the big conferences. We have you know either meals or some kind of get together in person people have made friendships people you know they do all kinds of art projects one year we had um uh pirate projects because it was pirate king the year that we did um the book set in japan uh we had a haiku contest so you know, I have I have artists who contribute drawings. I have people who write poetry, who do cosplay, who have tattoos. Oh my goodness! <laughs> the Russell and Holmes tattoos are always interesting. When somebody hikes up their skirt or hikes down their sleeve and shows me their Russell and Holmes, and you think, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you already done it. It's too late for me to comment on it, but. Yeah, Good on you. Yeah. They're great fun. And, you know, so I post there's some of them posted on the website. There's a page of odds and ends photographs. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful. But it's a way of building community. And I also do, you know, blog posts and we've done a lot of um, images, graphics for social media and events like this. Yeah. I'm also doing 12 library events during the year. We're doing a library event more or less each month. Um and the, the libraries are great because I had them apply. I'd send in an application, fill out a form and say, who are you? What do you do? What would you be willing to do on the side? You know, what would, you know, book clubs or whatever. And I went through and I chose 12 libraries all over the country. Um, some of them are virtual, some of them in person. One of them is uh, um, a synagogue library. Uh, that'll do, that'll be in Nashville. I'm doing that in person one of them is a women's prison in southern california i'll be doing a live event with them wow. so you know there's i just i love libraries and i love to be able to work with them so i thought if i'm celebrating a book and how well it's lasted um libraries are are chief among my thank you as it as it should be because libraries contain the seeds of our culture and you never know, somebody will read your book, they'll decide who this Sherlock Holmes guy is and go read yeah. Conan Doyle. Yeah. We've seen yeah, this I... elsewhere with, you know, Agatha Christie movie adaptations, which we write about. There are mm -hmm. people who've never heard of her, even today, they yeah. see uh, the 2000 Murder on the Orient Express with Alfred Molina and, they, and start reading her books. Yeah. And this is how you stay alive and stay vital. Yeah. Uh, it, Tough question for you here, since you have so many of these Russell books. Is there one that is particularly satisfying or a favorite? Not the best, but just one that you say, I I like that one. You know, they, they always ask you this, and I, I always sort of think, you know, why don't you ask me an easy question like choosing my favorite grandchild or something? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, it it kind, of de kind of depends on the mood I'm in. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I love Beekeeper just because that was when I first met Sherlock Holmes and Mary Russell. Um, I really enjoyed um, Locked Rooms because it's San Francisco and I got to play with Dashiell Hammett. Uh, I really had fun writing the game set in India um, mm -hmm. where my husband, you know, I mean, Noel could help me write some of those books and um, give me the give me the uh, local dialect for the swearing that they do. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I mean, I think that there's some, there's things I love about all the books, um, but I, I sort of, if you catch me at the, at the certain time, if somebody asked me which one of mine I would recommend, I usually hand the beekeeper just because it's the first one. Yeah. But you could as easily read the game or locked rooms. So. Yeah, to to find the one that uh, speaks to you as far as something you're interested in, whether it's yeah. Dashiell Hammett, which yeah, I would definitely read that one because I'm a I'm a Hammett fan, so it's always fun to see how somebody else, you know, treats him. Um, I understand you're working on another uh, Holmes Russell at this point. That's going to be I your am. next book. I am. Yeah, it's it's scheduled for June uh, 2025. Yeah. So I am still about halfway through the first draft. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to involve a character who appeared in one short story. Um, the the uncle, father's Russell's father's brother, mm -hmm. um, who was a ne'er-do-well and um, gave her the throwing knife that she, that she uses to this day and who then disappeared in about 1912 and hasn't been seen since. So he's going to reappear and we will find out all the things that he has been up to. I think I think it's going to be structured as a heist novel. Ooh, okay. Well, it won't hold you to it because things can always change, but I like that idea. I like <laughs> it a lot. Russell how, involved in a heist. I mean, how, how can you not? <laughs> be still on my heart. <laughs> uh, so where can where can people find you if they want to know more about you and your books uh well um i i mean i'm going to be at all three of those conferences so anyone from you know your audience who's going to be at a conference i'll be underfoot um i also have a lot of stuff that's coming up during the spring i have all those to do there's still 10 of the nine of the library events and in-person things so if you don't live in the bay area the san francisco bay area and you don't want to fly in from wherever to see me in person um there's a lot of online things that i'm doing right. and um, and of course as i mentioned these four events and i'm on facebook um if you're into the russell books uh you can join the Facebook group, which is called The Beekeeper's Apprentices. And it's a very lively and fun group. Um, and uh, and I'm on Instagram. So I don't I don't do X, although Mary Russell does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to look her up then. Yeah. It's look her up then. Mary underscore Russell is her, is her handle. So she's, she's been on Twitter for many, many years and. Um... All right. That'll be interesting. And of course you also have your website, which I think is probably one of the best, one of the cleanest ones I've seen among author websites. It, uh, whoever it's put it together did one. a very good job. Yeah. I mean, it has, I've got, you know, a couple of extra pages in there that of art stuff and projects and word games and yeah. um, short stories that are tacked on. So you can kind of get lost in the website. Absolutely. Well, Laurie, thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. This has just been a thrill for me. Um, and I want to say this is Bill Peschel for Mechanicsburg Mystery Presents. And I hope that your favorite book is the one you're reading right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. The Mechanicsburg Mystery Presents podcast is sponsored by the Mechanicsburg Mystery Bookshop in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. The store is open with limited hours, plus we accept appointments and offer a drive-by service. The store will also ship books to your home, including those from the Peschel Press Mystery Line, including our annotated editions of novels by Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers. To learn more, visit the store at www.mysterybooksonline.com.
www.thebibleinstitute.com. And thank you for listening.